I noticed in the festival survey form that we sent out, and uh, I've also had people write letters to, or talk to me about this, there were a number of requests for sermons on prophecy. And I hadn't really thought about it, but uh, uh, Allie was telling me that last night that she thought that since the Tyler Church had started, we'd had one sermon on prophecy in that whole time. I think Mr. Freeman delivered that one. And I thought that was uh, uh, kind of unfortunate in a way. But also, I also thought that, you know, if I were going to bed at night and I wanted to sit there and read my Bible for a while, and I wanted to uh, find some encouragement and some uplift and uh, something to feel good about to go to sleep on, I would not read prophecy. In fact, <laughs> you have to struggle a little bit in the Bible to find something that just just like what I'm talking to you about. Most of the places you'd find it in the Psalms, as a matter of fact, is really your best bet. But I'm afraid from time to time when you get into the Psalms, you, get, you find yourself all of a sudden where you were in one kind of Psalm and this one, you're into prophecy in the next one, and you're back in the old prophecy boat again. Now, this is not going to be today a feel-good sermon, because it is a sermon about prophecy. And I'm also, though, I'm not going to give one of those prophecy sermons in which we tear the world out there apart and jump all over them, stomp on them, cut them up into small pieces, and say, see how bad the world is. I really think far more relevant for a sermon on prophecy is a prophecy or a prophet that might have something to do with the 20th century church, our church, as we live it, and as we experience it. Now, if, you, if I were to ask you, you know, a lot of you taking notes out there, just to ask you to think for a moment as I'm getting ready to get into the sermon today, of all the prophets in the Bible, what prophet do you think might be most likely to be apropos to or have a prophecy apropos to the 20th century church? Not the New Testament church. I'm not talking about the church in the first century. I'm talking about the 20th century church, that one going down toward the year 2000 that we are a part of, with the experiences that we've had and all the things that we've done and gone through, which book would you think would be most likely to fit that category? While you think about it, I want to remind you of 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15, where Paul wrote to Timothy and said that, From a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, and I'm not going to talk much about doctrine today, maybe a little, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So consequently, and you all know that when he said this to Timothy, he's talking about the Old Testament. And he's talking about scriptures that are profitable to us and to them for, for doctrine, for reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. And so when I go back to the Old Testament and I find a prophet who has some reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness for the 20th century church, I think to myself, okay, people want to hear a prophecy, let's talk about prophecy. Now, I don't know what prophet you had in mind or which one you jotted down that you thought might be the one, but in my opinion, the one that fits that category the best is Malachi. I don't know why, on reflection, as I sat down this morning and studied my way through Malachi, and I worked on it last night, too, I don't know why we haven't had more to say about Malachi. I don't know why we haven't turned to Malachi more frequently than we have and to try to grasp or to deal with what this prophet has to say to us today. Now, there are seven significant distinctions or divisions, I might say, in the book of Malachi, and they are characterized by a, a, a phraseology, a style of, of presenting uh, a counter-argument, as it were, and I'll point them out to you as I go along so that we can see the seven different major points that God makes in the book of Malachi. But first of all, Malachi was probably writing, the commentaries aren't certain at all, because he gives you no historical references, he doesn't mention any historical names, but the evidence seems to fall out that he was a contemporary of Nehemiah that he was perhaps even prophesying in the, there was an interregnum, a period of time between the two active periods of Nehemiah, and that maybe he fell in that. I don't think the fact that he doesn't mention Nehemiah's name is significant at all. I think that the, the structure of the book and the things that were going on point to a, the, the fact that the temple had been built, that the priesthood had gone back to work, and that places him right shortly after the, you know, the reconstruction of the temple and places him very near the time of Malachi. And he begins his prophecy by saying, The burden of the word of the Lord 
to Israel by Malachi. The King James translator's choice of the word burden, I think, is very appropriate for a prophet because, frankly, it is a burden to prophesy. It is a load for a prophet to have to carry to come before God's people with the kind of message that Malachi has to come with. He starts off with probably the four most encouraging words that he possibly could use. I have loved you. I have loved you, saith the Lord. And that is a, is, is a tremendously encouragement, encouraging message. But look what he says then. God says to Israel, I have loved you. Yet you say, well, wherein have you loved us? How can we tell? I mean, what is there that I should know and I should say, oh, yeah, God really loves me. I really feel loved. Now, mind you. These are people who are not that long back from captivity. They had been in captivity for 70 years. In fact, most of them had been born in captivity and had only been able to be brought back to Israel in more recent years. So this is not all that long after the return. It is the period of time in which the temple was constructed, the priest went back to work, and initially, at least, it was a time of revival. It was a time of tightening down and of buckling up and pulling up the bootstraps, you know, and getting yourself ready and getting on and serving God. But we've come to a time now to where God can say to these people, I have loved you. And you're saying back to me, I don't think you care. I just don't see any evidence that God really cares. And I suspect that there have been times in the lives of many who will hear my voice at this time, who will say to themselves, yeah, I, I have had times when I felt like God didn't really care. I didn't see any evidence that he cared. I prayed, he didn't answer, and so I say, well, how can I tell that you love me? Well, now God's answer to these people in this time was specific, and I want you to think of yourself in this case, not, you know, the, 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 it isn't, this isn't a prophecy to the 20th century church. It is a prophecy that reveals God and his relationships with man. Now, in this particular circumstance, he starts off by saying, wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? Yeah, brothers. And yet, he says, I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now, that's a long story, and it's not, a, not, not something I want to go into a great deal of this. But what he did, he said, I want you to take just a moment to look back and realize that I could just as easily have chosen Esau as I chose your fathers. I could just as easily have given you the barren lands that Esau has over there across Jordan and down south in that miserable, wretched place down there. I could just as easily have done that. But I didn't do that. I put you in this land, a beautiful land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And it is, it, it's not what it was, I have no, have no doubt today, like it was in the time when Israel lived there. But even today, it's a, it's a nation that, that if I were blindfolded and taken suddenly and plumped down in a taxi cab on my way up the hills to Jerusalem and they opened a window and let me smell, I would know where I was by the smell of the trees. It's a beautiful land. It has strong memories for those of us who have some kind of or any kind of association with it. And so, Edom, you could have been out there where they are. So I suppose the message to us then would be, God says to us, I have loved you. And you say, well, well how, how have you loved me? And one of the first things God says, look, you really need to look back down the backtrack and consider where you might have been and what might have been done. He said, I chose you and I hated Esau. Now, that, that's, a, that's a fascinating concept there because the implication of it is that he chose them in the womb before either one of them had, had a chance to merit anything. And here we are with no merit of our own to justify what God has done for us and what God has given us, and yet he has loved us. Now, Edom says, well, that's, Edom is another name for Esau. We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they'll build, but I'm going to throw it down. They shall call them the border of wickedness, the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. And your eyes will see it, and you will say the Lord will be magnified in all the borders of Israel. Now, the divisions that we're going to see in this book all hinge on this little phrase, that phrase I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say. Here is the truth. And here is what you say. So this you say, you say, you say will come back again and again. Then he says in verse 6, As a son honors his father, and this is the second division of Malachi that starts right here. 
A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? Thus saith the Lord of hosts to you, O priest, who despise my name. And you say, well, how have we despised your name? What are you talking about? We haven't despised your name. Well, there's some interesting clues in here. First of all, he starts this off by saying, a son honors his father. If I'm a father, where's my honor? How come I don't feel honored by you? How come there's nothing coming back to me? How come I'm not held up as, to, in, and exalted among you and, and by all the things that you do and by the way you live your life? If I am a master, how come you aren't afraid of me? You know, a servant fears his master. He's going to do what the master says because he knows there might be something bad happened to him. I mean, where's my honor on the one hand? Where's my fear on the other? No, I don't have any of that here. I'm going to say to you then, you priests. Now, what's significant about this? That if we're going to take this to heart, we've got to take it all the way to the temple, inside the temple, to the high priest, to the core of the leadership, the spiritual leadership, the religious leadership of God's people. It starts right there and goes out to everybody. It's not a question of the preachers, the priests, the teachers, the scholars, and all that sort of thing being right, and all these dumb people out here being wrong. God says from the priests on out or on down or however you want to look at it, this is the way it is. Now, there's an impulse, you say, well, you despise my name to think, well, they're taking God's name in vain, or uh, that maybe this is a part of the Yahwism or Yahvist uh, controversies of the sacred name business and so forth. No, I'm afraid not. Because he says, they, they say, well, how did we ever pollute your name? How did we despise your name? He says this, you offered polluted bread upon my altar. Not by the way you use his name, folks. You despise him by coming, the priest comes, to the altar of God and offers polluted bread upon it. So the worship of God has not stopped. The temple service is still going on. God's name is still invoked among the people. They pray to him. They come down to the temple at the hours of prayer. The morning and the evening sacrifice are done. All of the form and the structure of religion is being carried on. But he says, you have offered polluted bread upon my altar. Something is wrong with what you are doing. When you come and bring something to me, it isn't right. That's number two. Here comes number three. You say, well, wherein... Have we polluted you? You know, you first of all, you despise my name. Well, how do we do that? He says, by offering polluted bread on my altar. Number three, how then have you have we despised you? How have we polluted you? And he says, in that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible, just beneath contempt. Well, now wait a minute. I don't believe for a minute that there was anybody in the priesthood at that time as there would not be today in any ministry that I would know of, who would stand up before a group of people and say, or would even say in their private home, or even in their prayer closet, or even somewhere else, that they would ever allow to pass their lips the words, the table of the Lord is contemptible. Now, you do know what the table of the Lord is, don't you? It's the altar. Paul will speak of it in Corinthians when he talks about how that, 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 that when we come to partake of the Lord's Supper or the Passover, we are partaking of the Lord's table. And in the Passover is a sacrifice, and the sacrifices are connected to the altar, and so here is the table of the Lord. Nobody ever said that, right? I think we can all agree that no priest in his private chamber is going to say, well, the table of the Lord is contemptible, right? Okay, well, how does this happen? God says... Here's how it happens. If you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? I'll tell you what you do. You take this animal, this lame or blind animal that you're bringing in here and offering on my altar. You take it down to the governor and you present it as a gift to the governor. And ask, I'm going to ask you, how's the governor going to receive this gift at your hand? I mean, you don't take gifts to people that are, that are bent, broken, or defective. 
I mean, you went around, a lot of you did this year, and bought feast gifts for friends of yours. And you didn't go buy them something that was, that was broken. You didn't buy them something that was torn. You didn't buy, buy them something that was defective. Or if you did, it certainly the defect wasn't visible or matter, didn't matter. You didn't do that. When you buy a gift for somebody, you want to give them something that's right. So God says to you, to, to these priests, go ahead, take this lamb, offer it to the governor, and see how it will be received. And the answer, of course, is, well, he, he's not going to be pleased with you, and he's not going to accept your, per, your person. And so here we are. You know, we, we come before God. What does he mean, that our dollar bills that we put in the plate have got to be perfect and spotless and so forth? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think what he is talking about here is people who in their worship of God, in the service of God, start cutting corners. And they're not honoring God. They're going through the motions. They're doing it because they're supposed to do it. And their heart is not in it. And anyone who could bring a blind animal to the altar and sacrifice it to God is saying in his heart of hearts, God doesn't even care or know what I am doing here. And God says, no, you have polluted me. And they say, well, how have we polluted you? In that you say the, the table of the Lord is contemptible. You have no respect for the offering of God or the table of God. And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us, for this has been by your means. Will he regard persons, saith the Lord of hosts? And now he puts a question to these men who are comparable to the preachers today. And I don't want you, though, to excuse yourself while we talk about the preachers. I don't, I don't want you to sit on the sideline and think, this isn't about me. Who is there among you that would shut the doors for nothing? What does that mean? Well, shutting the door is probably the simplest, easiest, lowliest, most you know, quick and easy done with task that there was to have been done in the temple, just to shut the doors. I would like to know, he said, which one of you would do that without getting paid for it? Which one of you would do that without something coming back? You won't even shut the doors for nothing. You won't kindle a fire on my altar for nothing. You've got to get paid, or you're not going to do your ministry. You got to get paid, or you won't go out across town some night late and, 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 and pray for somebody who's sick. I think that's really striking to see that coming back. And he's actually this accusation comes bang back to the priests, right at the very heart and the very core of everything. You won't even close the doors without getting paid for it. He says, he said, you won't do this. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord, and I'm not about to accept an offering of your hand. Now, I said it wasn't a feel-good sermon. It sure doesn't feel good for me to think about it and to realize that, that when you get to the kind of frame of mind where in your service of God, you won't go to work for God unless you're getting paid for it. Uh, you won't do things for God unless there's something coming back to you for it. I mean, it's, it, it hurts. And then it says, I don't have any pleasure of you. So a priest coming in here who, who comes in here with the attitude, I'm not doing this job unless I get paid. God says, I'm not, you, you can put your, all the altars, you can burn cows up here, you can do all the stuff you want to do. I am not going to accept that offering of your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even to the going down of the same, my name will be great among the Gentiles. It's a hard thing for people to get their minds around it, that God's name was already great among the Gentiles. They already knew about God among the Gentiles. There were people among the Gentiles who knew and worshipped God even at this time. Balaam was among the Gentiles and knew and worshipped God. God chooses the people he wants in his time and his place. He said, My name from the rising of the sun to the going down of the sun shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name in a pure offering. Pure offering. In every place, all over the world, incense can be offered to God. And it will be a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, saith the Lord God. But you, my own priests... My own preachers, my own ministers, my own elders, my own people, you have profaned it. And you have said the table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof, even his food, is contemptible. And not only that, you have said also, behold, what a weariness it is. The service of God makes me tired. It just... 
wears me out. I just don't have the energy for it anymore. I guess somebody else ought to do it. A weariness. And you have sniffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And you have brought that which was torn, and was lame, and was sick, and thus you brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand? You know, when you there's a song, I believe, in our, our book, doesn't it? It says, give of your best to the Master. Give of the strength of your youth. Give of your best to the Master. And here we are, the last half of the 20th century, and the challenge comes rolling down on us. I mean, are, are, you, are you tired of God? Are you just old, weary, burnout Christian, and you just can't, can't uh, suck it up and get down there and really do the work of God anymore, no heart for it anymore? Well, he said, you, this is the attitude of people sometimes. And this happened to these people. They, were, they had spent 70 years in captivity. Like I said, many of them were born in captivity, and already they are worn out again and tired and tired of God. He said, I don't understand this. And my, you, you really expect me to accept your work whenever, in fact, you say you're, in your heart of hearts you're tired of me. And you're not bringing me your best. You're bringing me less than your best. Cursed be the deceiver that has in his flock a male and vows and sacrifice to the Lord instead of his, his, his good male. Sacrifices to the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord. And I don't think I should get anything less than a governor or a king or anybody else that you know in terms of gift. My name is dreadful among the heathen. But apparently, not here. Now, O ye priests, he says, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. The last thing in the world you want is to have a minister, a clergyman, who's gotten in this situation, who comes to you and says, Well, bless you, my brother, the Lord's blessing be upon you, because God says, I'm going to curse your blessings. You don't want blessings from somebody who's in that frame of mind. I'll curse your blessings. In fact, I've cursed them already because you haven't taken it to heart. I will corrupt your seed. I will spread dung upon your faces. This is hard stuff. Even the dung of your solemn feasts. And they'll just take you away with the whole thing. He's warning them of another captivity when they only just came out of one. Now, it's interesting that he said, your solemn feasts, and I don't really quite know how to take that. I do know, though, that he didn't say, I'll spread the, the he didn't ever refer to his feasts as dung. He said, I will spread upon your faces the dung of your solemn feasts that you have got, all these things that you do, and you're going to be gone. And you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. I made a covenant, I cut a covenant, I made an agreement, I entered into it and I bound myself. My covenant with, was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. When we started all this stuff out, Levi was afraid of me. The law of truth was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and turned many people away from iniquity. And I look back on my back backtrack of where I have been since I have been a part of the church of God, and I say there was a time when I really did know ministers who had a covenant with God, who were dedicated to God, who feared his name and stood afraid before God. And the law of truth was in their mouth. Iniquity was not found in their lips. They walked with God in peace and equity and, in fact, turned many people away from iniquity. Say what you will about problems that came along later. But that did happen. He said, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he, the priest, is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And what is it we're supposed to be about? They should seek the law at God's mouth. Because in the law, we know the difference between right and wrong. In the law, we can, we can point to you and say, this is the way, walk in it. And we can say, this is what God says is right, this is what God says is wrong. And that all of us should be, be trying to give God our absolute very best and to live for Him. But you, and he's talking to Levi. As I said, you can imagine all the ministers you've ever known. But I warn you, don't excuse yourself in this. He says to Levi, you have departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. And you know, here we are, down toward the end of the 20th century in the church. And the ministry, who are not Levites, they're not even spiritual Levites. They're, they have a, a, a metaphorical relationship to Levi, and that's all. But there is a very strong metaphor there. That those people who are supposed to be leading the people of God 
supposed to be pointing them to the law of God, supposed to be setting an example before them, supposed to be telling them this is God's way, let's walk this way together, have caused people to stumble at the law and to fall over it on their faces. Instead of finding the law of God, loving the law of God, serving the law of God, and giving God their absolute best. Therefore, have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, seeing as you have not kept my ways, but you have been partial in the law. I said this was not a feel-good sermon. It surely is not for me. Because I stand right in the middle of a category of people. If I were a Levite in that time, no matter how hard I had tried, no matter, you know, maybe I'm the best, but I'm not, I can only say that if I'm one of Levi at that time, and I'm standing among them when they get this, it'd be stupid for me to sit back and say, well, it's all of them, it's not me. Because he doesn't really make that kind of distinction. And what he is basically saying to them, the ministry at that time has failed God's people. And this time, I think the ministry might very well come under the same kind of judgment. Not every one. And there's no reason for people to come to hate and despise the ministry. There's no reason for them to, you know, as the, with the modern phrase, just throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I wish we could find something better than that, you know, now. It's gotten too trite. But to realize that there are ministers and then there are ministers. And that so much of the time the ministry have not really led. Have we not all one father? How many fathers are there out there, folks? I think there's only one, best I can tell. Has not one God created us? Yeah, it's true. Why then do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? How come we're doing this type of thing? Judah, not just Levi, mind you now, we're talking about the whole kit and caboodle of them, has dealt treacherously and an abomination has been com committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. An abomination? Yeah. For Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord which he loved and married the daughter of a strange God. Now you have to understand, folks, this is what he means by profaning the covenant. That Judah as a whole have forsaken God whom they originally loved and have married the daughter of a strange God. And I want you to think about this. This is talking about post-exilic Judas. It's not talking about Judah back in the days when, when Elijah was there, and they got out and they killed all the prophets of Baal. This is after they had been in 70 years of captivity. This is after they came back to Jerusalem at the end of this time. It's after what we have been told is this great revival, when they became so diligent in the law, and so diligent in Sabbath-keeping, and so diligent in everything. And here, at the time of Malachi, when the new temple, another temple has been built, Heliot reaches out and he says, These people, the, the, the people of, of Judah, have married a strange god. Because he isn't anything like me. Which I think is a, a terrible condemnation that God has put upon those people. The Lord will cut off the man that does this. The master, that is the teacher, and the scholar, cut I mean, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offers an offering to the Lord of hosts. The scholars... The teachers, the Levites who offer the sacrifices in the temple, all the people who teach, lead, and, and, and are influential among you, he says, I'm going to cut them all off. And this you have done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, weeping and crying out, insomuch that he regards not the offering any more, nor receives it with any kind of goodwill at your hand. Now that's interesting. Because what he is saying at this point is that I really... When someone comes into my presence and brings an offering to be offered on the altar before me, and they kill the offering, and they sprinkle the blood, and they burn those parts which are supposed to be burned, and they prepare the other parts which are going to be cooked and feasted on. He says, what I would really like for this to be is big smiles on faces. Everybody's all excited about the fact that it's Holy Day or Sabbath or it's a special occasion. And we're offering an offering to God and we're honoring God. And it's a time for joy and gladness and we're all upbeat about this type of thing. And God says, this is the way I want an offering to come in. But when you're coming into me, your head is down, your face is down, you got tears running down your face, you're covered so much that you're covering my altar. How in the world do you expect me, God says, to enjoy your worship when you are so abjectly miserable. It's a lot like I was telling you not long ago when I gave a sermon on prayer, and I said, we start out our prayers, oh, God, help me out of this miserable, rotten, wretched mess I've got myself into. 
We don't care about his plan. We don't care what he's doing. All the thing we can bring to God is, I'm in trouble here. I'm in trouble there. I need this. I need that. Give me that and give me the other thing. Whereas the Lord's Prayer says, you start off by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, how great you are, how greatly to be praised. Your name is exalted above all the heavens. Hallowed be thy name. And you talk about, for God, for that, for thy kingdom come, for the time when you talk about his will be done, all that is about God, not about you. And that somehow, in the course of coming before God to worship Him, somehow there ought to be a smile, there ought to be some joy, there ought to be some happiness. You know, I thought we did pretty well in Kissimmee this year in that regard. The longer song services and the joyous hymn services that we had and the fact that that when we got down, I, I don't think anybody down there at any time that I ever heard spent much time looking back over their shoulder and worrying about what other people had done. I frankly feel that all the folks who went down to Kissimmee, I give them credit. They came down there to worship God. They came to honor Him. They were happy while they were there, and, and, and they, were, they, they really did follow through on that. But I think that so much of the time, though, nowadays, amongst God's people, not just you here, but of people all over the place, that it's a, there's, there's a, a crying and a weeping and a moaning and a groaning about the things that are wrong when we come to God instead of a rejoicing of in Him and the things that He has done. Now, still, after God has said this to you, uh, how do you expect me to receive this offering at goodwill in your hand when you are coming in before me so miserable? Yet you say again, why? What is this? Because the Lord has been witnessed between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, while she is your companion and she is the wife of your covenant. And you know, there's a funny thing about this. Covenant breakers are covenant breakers. And a priest or a Levite who would break the covenant that God made with Levi might be just as likely to break the covenant that he had made with his wife. And vice versa. Because God really did expect of Levi that they have a wife and that they have one wife and that they stay with that wife and that they be faithful to that wife. And this is the way it went. And this is, of course, I think, perhaps one of the reasons why, when Paul wrote to Timothy, that he said that a, an elder, a minister, an overseer is to be the husband of one wife. is because he needs to be a person who keeps covenant. And marriage is a covenant. It's agreements, promises. And people who break those promises don't belong in the ministry. And that's simple enough, not hard to figure. He says, well, now, you have dealt treacherously against the wife of your youth, yet she is your companion and the wife of your covenant. Didn't he make you one? Yet he has the res residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. God wants the children that are born in his country and his, among his people to be a godly seed. Not the seed of strangers, not the seed of, of who knows which marriage or whatever. God says, this is not what I want. Now, I've written an article, Is There Life After Divorce, to deal with the question of what do you do when you've got sin. I, I don't condemn people who have been divorced and remarried and are struggling to make their life work after that's happened to them. It's not the point of this. The point is that those who haven't gotten to themselves in that miserable past, and it is miserable, ask anybody who's gone through a divorce and they'll tell you. It's miserable. But to anybody who has not done that, let's see right now that we understand that, that marriage is a covenant. And he says, don't, he says, therefore take heed to your spirit and don't let anybody deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. One of the reasons this cast the man against his wife is because really this is being addressed to Levi. We're still talking to Levi as a group, and he is supposed to be faithful to his wife. For the Lord God of Israel says, he, and it says he that, I'm sorry, for the Lord, the God of Israel saith, that he hates putting away. God hates divorce. Now, if it's happened to you, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry for you. I'm sorry for what's happened to you. And I know the pain you've suffered is enough punishment to last anybody a lifetime. I don't think God will want to add anything beyond that. But I think that for those that, that may have trouble in their marriage, they really need to, hard, to look very hard at the question before they start thinking about letting it get away from them. Because God hates that. And he says, take heed to your spirit that you deal not treacherously. And by that he means being faithful to your word, faithful to your promises, faithful to your covenant. Because Levi had entered into a covenant with God, had made promises to God, and God expected Levi to live up to those promises. And you and I... When we come into the Passover service every year, we actually, in a sense, renew a covenant that we have cut with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we should be faithful to that covenant and not deal treacherously with that covenant and be faithful to our Lord, our Master, and our husband who is to come. Number four now of the divisions of this book. 
He says, you have wearied the Lord with your words. You just make me tired, God says. And you say, well, how have we wearied him? Now, are you beginning to get a pattern here? Here's a pattern of people who have managed on, this is the fourth different thing here, to get themselves contrary to God, and yet they still declare their own innocence. It's a spirit of self-justification, which is one of, the, one of the most difficult spirits to overcome. That I'm right, and he's wrong, or she's right, and she's wrong, or what have you, I don't care what it is. That spirit of self-justification that keeps maintaining one's own rightness will kill you. It will kill you. It will destroy you. Because it takes away from you any opportunity of growing and of becoming better or, or stronger than you are. You have wearied the Lord. And yet you say, well, how have I wearied God? There's no reason why God should be tired of me. You do it when you say that everyone that does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them. You turn things upside down. You actually say, this, this person who is evil, you declare, well, he's actually a good man. Or you say, well, where is the God of judgment? I don't think God's going to judge this matter. I don't think God sees that that way. Here's God's response. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek, you think you really want to see him, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But I want you to understand something. Who may abide the day of his coming? Who's going to stand when he appears? Is anybody going to still be standing, or are we all going to be flat on the ground? For he is like a refiner's fire, like lye soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, and purge them like gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. At last we'll be able to offer the right kind of offering to God. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in former years. I will come at near to you for judgment. I'll be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those who oppress the hireling in his wages. I'll be a witness against those people who hurt the widow and the fatherless, and who turn aside the stranger from his right. And don't fear me, saith the Lord. I'm going to judge all these things. Now, there's a good list of things that we really ought to take heed to. There ought not to be any of this sorcery or, or, or consulting familiar spirits among us. There ought not to be adultery among us. There shouldn't be people who are swearing or actually giving their word and then breaking it. There shouldn't be people who oppress people who work in their wages. There shouldn't be the widow and be people who oppress the widow or the fatherless or who actually turn aside the stranger because he's a stranger and they can take advantage of it. For I am the Lord. I change not. And I want you to understand something, my children. It's because I don't change that you have survived. My mercy doesn't go away. Because I have not changed, you have not been consumed. Even from the day of your fathers. Now, this is number five. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. You return to me, and I will return to you, saith the Lord of hosts. Here is a message for God's people at any time, any place, any circumstance. Return to me, and I will return to you. It's that simple. But you said, well, wherein shall we return? We're innocent. What do you mean return? We haven't gone away. Here again, the self-justifying spirit that, that I don't think I've done anything wrong. What are you talking about? Here's his answer. Will a man rob God? But you have. You have robbed me. Now, they come back and say, What in the world are you talking about? And that's number six. You say, Wherein have we robbed you? Now, that's an interesting question. How is it possible for a man to go up to heaven, break into God's throne room, and steal rubies and diamonds and silver and gold and all that kind of stuff? That's not possible, is it? What's he talking about? They say, well, we don't understand. How have we robbed you? His answer, you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. Now, that's interesting. Now, I'm familiar with all the arguments. I've heard, I've read, gone through all of them, ad infinitum, ad nauseum. I've worked them up one side and down the other, and I, I, I'm familiar with all of the arguments about, well, tithes are only supposed to be on this, and tithes are only supposed to be on that. Now, as far as I'm concerned, tell it to God. 
What I find in this book right here is, what I find right here is that the tithes and a reasonable offering belong to God, and the failure to pay those is robbery, whatever they are. And you have to answer to him for that, not to me. I, it's neither here nor there for me. You know, I, one of the things I like about the situation we've got here, that I am not the pastor of this church, I have no control over anything financial about this church or any other church on the face of this planet. So when I say to you, you've robbed God in tithes and offerings, I am not serving myself in making the statement. That's one of the things I like about the place where I stand right now. I can just tell you the truth, and you can do whatever you think you ought to do with it. The truth is, the tithe belongs to God. And he says, you, you need to return to me. How do you need to return? You need to return by, by stopping robbing me. Now, it's true that God gave the tithe to Levi for a while for the service that Levi performed. I don't know if you realize that, that the reason why the Levites took the temple was because God said, I have given the tithe to Levi. It was his then to give, right? I have given it to him for the service that they performed. They don't perform the service. They have no right to the tithe. But to any time, any place, under any circumstances, the tithe is the tribute that we owe to God, to honor God, to respect God. And the failure to pay that tithe is robbery. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. And you bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, God says, and you prove me. Just test me. Try me out. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. He's talking now to a whole people. The whole people, you've all robbed me. And if you'll all start, you know, turn around and change in this regard, he said, you won't be able to stay on top of the blessings that will come your way. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes. The locust will be gone. He'll not destroy the fruit of your ground. Your vine will not cast her fruit before her time in the field. And all nations will call you blessed, because you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Do you have the faith? Because there, one thing I'll tell you for sure, the tithe has not been abolished, but it really does take faith to begin to tithe when you have not been doing so. But if you want to know why things aren't working for you, that may be one place to look in your life. If you're robbing God, it's not going to come back. Then he goes on to number seven. Your words, he said, have been stout against me. You've really been pretty bold in the things you've said about me. And yet you say, here we go, number seven, well, what have we spoken so much against you? Here is his reply. You have spoken against me in that you have said, It is vain to serve God. I have served him, and I haven't gotten anything out of it. And you went on to say, What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? We've done all these things. Nothing's come our way. And it ties back into what he said earlier. There's not one of you here that will open the doors without getting paid for it. And you come around and you say, well, what profit is there in serving God? Is that what we're about here, folks? Profit? Are we going to serve God for only for what we're going to get out of it? Do you remember that that was the conflict between God and Satan about Job? That Satan came before God and says, you know, God says, look at this man. He's, he's righteous. He's upright. He hates evil. He's living a good life. What did Satan come back? Does God, does Job serve you for nothing? You put a hedge around him on every side. You protected him in every way in his life. His whole life is working like gang. Why shouldn't he love you? Now, I'll tell you what. You take any of that away from him, and he'll curse you to, his, to, his, to your face. Did Job deserve what happened to him? By God's testimony, no. He did not. The big question mark was, was Job serving God for profit or because God was God? And that's the question every one of you have got to answer for yourself. Will I serve God for nothing? Is that, have I got to have something coming back? Have I got to get paid? Has it got to come my way? What profit is it that you have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before God? And now we call the proud happy, and they that work wickedness are set up, and everyone that tempts God is delivered. So, hey, it looks to me in the world like the best thing to do is not to serve God. The proud people are happy. They're doing just fine. But the people who humble themselves before God are suffering. Oh, yeah. Sometimes that's a part of the work that God calls upon us to do. 
Then they that feared the Lord spoke often to one another, and the Lord heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Spent some time thinking about him, his reputation, and his mighty deeds. He says, They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them like a man spares his own son that serves him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. So there is something to be seen, something to be known about that. There are those who serve God, and there are those who don't serve him, and there is some discernment necessary to know the difference. For behold, the day comes that shall burn like an oven, and all the proud and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. They'll be burned up like stubble in the field. And the day that comes shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and leave them neither root nor branch. But to you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up like calves of the stall, and you will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this, saith the Lord. But you know, between here and now, it's going to require a lot of faith on your part. There are going to be a lot of times when you're going to be called upon to worship me, to serve me, to obey me, and there is no pay coming at all. Nothing but hurt, nothing but pain. And you'd think, well, at least, at least leave me alone. No, I'm sorry. You're going to have to suffer for obeying God. You've got negative, you know, in that regard. But he says, the time is going to come when I make up my special jewels that you will be there. Remember you the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel and all my statutes and all my judgments. Don't forget them. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and I smite the earth with a destruction and a curse. Now, any man who claims to be Elijah is, in my, my opinion, a presumptuous fool. And if you want to know how to really think about it, I'll try to, try to tell you in more plainer terms. I think he is a presumptuous fool. John the Baptist, who actually had a right to the claim, denied it. He said, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. And I will tell you categorically, I believe that the person who will come at the time of the end to fulfill the role of Elijah will have precisely the same answer. Putting all that aside, anyone who reads verse 6, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with destruction. Anyone who reads that should realize that the destruction of the family is what is going to lead directly to the curse. And that any of us who have means or ability or possibility at hand, if we have the strength, we have the ability, we have the awareness, we have any kind of knowledge, that we can contribute to turning the heart of children to the fathers. Forget about being Elijah. You don't want to be. Trust me. Just realize, though, that the possibility of turning the heart of one child to his father, of one father to his child, is a part of a work that will be honored by God and blessed by God, and it is something to which any person of God must give urgent attention. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. Now, as I said when I started out, this is not a feel-good sermon. I really felt a considerable amount of pain, frankly, as I read through this book and the realization of the warnings that come upon these people in that time under those circumstances. And then to realize that what I was reading there, in a sense, was a pattern that God had laid down for that time, which one can then peel up and lay over the church at the end time and realize that God, who does not change will look upon us in much the same terms that he looked upon those people at that time. So there is much in here that I think that you could take to your prayer closet. There is much in here that you could take to, your, take to heart and consider in your own life that maybe this is a good time, because now is always the good time, to begin to pull up your socks, to straighten your life out before God, to give attention to the law of God, 
to find obedience and to bring a cheerful offering before him instead of being so dreary about things all the time, to, to actually begin to honor him as a father and to fear him as a master and not allow yourself ever to be in the position of saying, well, I just don't see how I've done anything to offend God or anything to get contrary to God, for then you find yourself in the same spirit as the people to whom God was talking in the book of Malachi. Maybe, maybe it won't be too long before the one comes on the scene who will begin to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Maybe it won't be too long before that forerunner of Christ will appear on the scene. But until he does, we've got plenty of work to do.